Hi, it's Miss Vital. This podcast is on Chapter 1, The Science of Biology. You might wonder, what really is science? If I asked you to define it, it might be hard for you to define. Science is really studying anything in nature. It's getting and looking at evidence. When doing science, it must be done in an orderly way. The scientific method is that orderly way to conduct an investigation. The first step is observation. You're going to notice and describe what is happening. I'm going to use an example throughout the explanation of the scientific method of a flashlight that's not working. So my observation is that my flashlight doesn't work. The second step of the scientific method is the question because my observation is going to lead me to a question. So what's wrong with my flashlight? The third step of the scientific method is a hypothesis. This is an explanation for your observation. It's something that can be tested. So my hypothesis is that the flashlight's batteries are dead. The fourth step of the scientific method is prediction. The prediction is if the hypothesis is correct. So if the batteries are dead, I'm going to perform an experiment which is going to test the hypothesis. So I will replace the batteries with new ones. The final step of the scientific method is predicted results. Then you will get a result. So your prediction is the if part and your predicted results are the then part of an if-then statement. So my predicted results is that then, once I replace the batteries, my flashlight will work. One way to test a hypothesis is with a controlled experiment. A controlled experiment only has one variable. The reason that you only use one variable is because when you look at the results at the end of your experiment, you need to know what caused those results. If you have more than one variable, you probably will not be able to tell which one caused your results. So only one variable in a controlled experiment lets you understand exactly why you got the results that you did. The independent variable is what is changed in an experiment. So the dependent variable then is what changes due to the independent variable. I'll give you an example of this in a minute. When you're doing an experiment, you collect data. Data is the information gathered during your experiment. And finally, based on the data, you're going to come to a conclusion. Your conclusion answers the question, does the data support the hypothesis? So to give you an example, Pill bugs are those little roly-poly bugs that you find underneath maybe a doormat or underneath a rock or a piece of wood that's been sitting outside. So I was in my backyard and I was doing some gardening and I observed that pill bugs are in different places around my backyard. So my question is, do pill bugs refer wet or dry environments? My hypothesis then becomes pill bugs prefer wet environments because it seems like where I find them, those areas are more wet than dry. So the if part of my if then statement is that if I place pill bugs in a choice chamber with a wet side and a dry side, the then portion of my if then statement is more pill bugs will move to the wet side. So I'm going to use these little choice chambers, which are basically like two petri dishes that are attached by a little bridge. In the bottom of each petri dish, I have a piece of paper. On one side, the paper is dry. On the other side, the paper is wet. I'm going to start by placing 10 pill bugs in the choice chamber. And over time, I'm going to count how many pill bugs are in the wet side and how many pill bugs are in the dry side. I will observe them for a half hour, and every five minutes I will write down how many pill bugs are on one side or the other. That becomes my data. So my independent variable in this experiment is the thing that I changed, and it's the moisture. One side is wet, one side is dry. The dependent variable 
is based on the independent variable. How many pill bugs are on each side is the dependent variable. I'm not controlling that. They're moving on their own. What I controlled, the independent variable, is the wet and dry side. So I record my data, and after a half hour, I analyze my data, and I come to the conclusion that pill bugs prefer a wet environment, which supports my hypothesis. Sometimes experiments aren't practical, so we need to come up with alternatives to controlled experiments. One of the things that people do is they observe nature in the world. For example, if we're going to study large storms like a tornado or a hurricane, we can't really create an experiment to do that. We have to observe the storms in the natural world. Another way that we can create scenarios that may not work in a controlled experiment is to use models. For example, DNA is a microscopic molecule in all living things. So we can build a model of DNA to actually be able to look at it and understand it because it's not something that we can observe without a very expensive microscope. We can also use mathematical models. Velocity is equal to distance over time. That's a mathematical model that we use to figure out how fast something is going in a given period of time. Another type of model are computers. You're all very familiar with animations on computers that simulate something that could potentially be real in nature. Exploration and discovery is an important part of the scientific process. Scientists need to be curious. They ask questions. Scientists need to be skeptical. They question ideas. Scientists also need to be open-minded. They need to accept new ideas. And they need to be creative because that's how good, good experiments are developed. Science often finds solutions for practical problems. These are useful solutions for common problems. For example, I was working in my yard and I noticed that there are a lot of insects eating my garden. So I need to figure out a solution to how to eliminate insects from my garden. Technology is applying science for practical reasons. You're all very familiar with technology, especially in the case of computers, but there's a lot of technologies out there that help us apply science. Scientists are also responsible for sharing their ideas and results. In order for research to be accepted, it must be repeated many, many times. So when scientists do research or do an experiment, they share their results with other scientists. Those other scientists should be able to repeat the work of the first scientist, get the same results in order for it to be credible and for it to be true. Some of the ways that scientists share their research or their results is through journals or conferences or as again you're all familiar with the internet. Sometimes the results of research or experiments become a theory. A theory is a widely supported idea that is supported by a lot of evidence. In other words it's been tested multiple times by different people and the same results always occur. When we look at science and society, we have to look at the ethics, morals, and behaviors that scientists and society have when considering science. Ethics are values or morals. They determine someone's behavior. A bias is a personal point of view. For example, if I was going to go to a food company that was producing five different types of cereal and they wanted me to taste test them, I have a bias towards chocolate. I love chocolate. So that love of chocolate may influence me to pick the cereal that was chocolate flavored versus the other one because it's my own personal preference. You're going to be studying biology this year and biology is defined as the study of life. An organism is a living thing. So all living things are considered organisms. 
in order for something to be considered living, it has to show all of the characteristics of life. Something like a computer or a car shows many of the characteristics of life, but it doesn't show all of them, therefore it's not considered living. The first characteristic of life is that all organisms have DNA. DNA is the genetic code that is passed from parent to offspring. The second characteristic of life is growth and development. All organisms grow from a fertilized egg to an adult. Um, the third is that all organisms respond to a stimulus. Stimulus is a change in the environment that causes a change in the organism. This example is that if a predatory bird is flying in one direction, the bird that, that it preys upon, the duck, is going to fly in the other direction. So what the predator is doing influences what the prey will do. All organisms reproduce. That's not to say that every single individual has to reproduce, but as long as enough individuals of one species reproduces, it will ensure that that species will be successful. Homeostasis is maintaining a constant internal environment. For example, your body has to be at a certain temperature. If your body temperature goes out of that range, you can suffer heat stroke or hypothermia. Organisms use material and energy to maintain their life, to grow, to reproduce, etc. Some organisms make their own food and energy. Other organ organisms have to take in food and energy from their environment. All organisms are made of at least one cell. The cell is considered the basic unit of life. And lastly, organisms evolve. Individual organisms do not evolve, but groups of organisms called populations that are the same species change over time. There are some other themes that we also look at in biology. These themes connect all living things. The first is structure and function. This is the shape of a structure in nature is determined by its function and vice versa. For example, the claw here on this crab is shaped to defend itself and to catch prey. The claw evolved because the crab needed to defend itself and attack prey. Another theme in biology is interdependence. All living things are connected. In other words, we will look at food chains or food webs where one organism, like a plant, produces food, another organism eats that, a third organism eats the second organism, and in those types of interactions, all living things are connected. All living things that exist on the earth and in the atmosphere are called the biosphere. This is the part of the earth, including the lower atmosphere, that supports life. All of the ecosystems on the planet combine to make the biosphere.